Yep. I'm ready. Yeah. I know we're gonna have some like Joe critical reaction. Just remember to hand off the mic when you're done. Yeah, I will do my best to do that. He doesn't normally get to talk about um, as political stuff in his class, so he's very excited to give this presentation on diversity, and I'm very excited to hear it. Um, so, Joe, take it away, I'll give you the mic. So, for those of you that are here, for those of you that are online, as I get questions, so I'll try my best to let you know what the answers, color codes are for the answers. Okay? Anyways, as I, uh, I'm excited to talk about this. You know, the biggest thing about me for, for talking about this is um, with my daughters being um, multiracial, being half white, half Asian, and, you know, having two daughters, one of the things that I like to try to emphasize and, and you know, kind of go through with them is just to let them understand that they can do anything that they want to do. And so one of the things, you know, one of the drives for me to do this presentation is to let them see what some of the women in the past have done to, uh, to allow them to kind of be able to set some precedents and, uh, you know, talk about some of the things that weren't done before before they did it and, you know, making a difference in, in the United States as well as the global world. And so this, this, is, kind of, uh, this is exciting from that perspective. And so, so as I talk about this, whenever we talk about influential American women, there's a lot, not just from a race perspective, you know, just not from the white perspective. A lot of women have made, a, you know, a tremendous role in order to make the 19th Amendment take place. And so where I wanted to take this was not necessarily the historical perspective on how the 19th Amendment came to be, because I'm not, an expert in that area. For me, I want to talk about, I went from just all women to ones that have some ethnicity and diversity that they bring with their background. And with that, that's where they kind of come because of their background influences how they want to try to make an impact overall. And so because of the 19th Amendment, they were able to go into politics more. When you get to vote, you get to participate more in the whole aspect of the electoral process. And as you all know, whenever you went to grade school, you know that our government is split up into three areas, the legislature, the judicial, and the executive. And so as I was thinking about how to do this presentation and split it up, I thought about doing the past, present, future. But then I said, you know what? There are just certain areas that I want to go into instead is that there are different types of influences you can have, and so this is the impact. So I wanted to break it up into three categories, but before we have these three categories, the first category I want to talk about is advocacy. Before they can go in, they had to make a difference, and so this is the first group that I wanted to talk about here, is some women that made some groups, you know, some, some impact, and so, again, for those of you that are streaming in late, this Kahoot's code will come up but for those of you that are here, make sure that you log in. So I'll give you a couple minutes here to log in. And then what we'll do is we'll pop up the question. And so how the presentation is going to work is before we go through each group, I'm going to have you guess the answers to some of these questions. And then I'll talk about some of the ladies, right? Now a few of the questions, I won't be talking about those ladies because they were talked about before. So. This is one of those things that if you were at previous presentations, that should give you a little bit of a clue, right? You should be able to answer that. Now, an additional incentive. The top five people that win, I have some prizes here. There's some candy, and then there's also a package of muffins, all right? So how we're gonna do this is you won't know until all the, all the way until the end. At the end of my presentation, we'll do that, you know, for those of you that are used to Kahoot, you know, they do that presentation. So the top five, one, two, three, four, five, you get to choose. For those of you, if you are online and you actually win, please email me, I'll get you a different prize, all right? So, 
Let's see how this goes. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to give it about another minute for people to log on. As I said, this code will be around and available. So for those of you that are coming in late, look for that code. And then let's begin. Oh, there's my family. We'll see how they do. All right. So the first question is, who delivered the speech during the Civil War title, Am I a, Ain't I a Woman? Is it the red, Shirley Chisholm, blue, the diamonds, Sojourner Truth, the circle, Ida B. Wells, or the square, Mary McLeod and Bethune? Bethune. All right, the triangle, Shirley, the diamond is Truth, circles, Wells, and the square is the through. Let's see how you guys do here. All right. All right, we have Morgan and English Joe at the top. Who was the first president of the Des Moines branch of the NAACP? Triangle is Mary Bethune. Diamond is Shirley Chisholm, circle is Sue M. Brown, and the square is Ida B. Wells. So for the first one, that was another. All right, let's go to the ones that I will be talking about. We have a switch. Nick and Morgan and English Joe are our top three. All right. Let's do three more questions before we continue on with the presentation. Which woman? worked to make sure that black Americans needed their share of the Roosevelt, Roosevelt's New Deal. Triangle is Shirley Chisholm. Diamond is Ida B. Wells. Circle is Fanny Lou Hamer. And the square is Mary Bethune. All right. And that will be the first person I'll be talking about. She has a very interesting experience in life. I like this switch. Ian's kind of showing up somewhere. All right, next question. Which woman scared President Johnson about her DNC talk that he called a last minute press conference at the same time? So her talk could not be on TV. Was it Fannie Lou Hamer? Triangle, Shirley Chisholm, Diamond, Circle, Ivy Wells, Square, Patricia Roberts Harris. And it was Fanny, Fanny Lou Hammer. All right. She, her fight for voting rights down in the South is something that will be very interesting that I'll be presenting. All right, one more, one more question before we talk about certain things. All right, we have Kayla and Allie at the top. Let's see how you guys do. Who was the first African-American woman to be elected to the U.S. Oh, hold on a second. House of Representatives. We will do this one, then we'll go back. Who was the first African woman to be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives? Is it Patty Mink? Triangle, Carol Brown, Triangle, Ida B. Wells, Circle, or Shirley Chisholm, Square. All right, so we won't, I won't reveal that. Let's go to our talk. So with Mary, McLeod Bethune, one of the things to know about her, she was born on July 10th, 1875, and she was born in South Carolina. She's one of 17 children. She was born to parents of formerly enslaved people, and when she was nine years old, she was able to pick about 250 pounds of cotton a day. 
So even though they are parents of formerly enslaved people, they still have to work. They still have to help contribute to the family. She was the only one of the 17 children in that family that were able to go to school. And this picture right here is the picture of the one room school that she went to. And what she would do is she would go, and then when she'd come home, she would teach her siblings all the things that she learned. After she graduated from school, she went and graduated from a seminary in 1893, got her bachelor's there, and she studied at the Dwight's Moody Institute for Home and Foreign Missions. She studied here because she wanted to go to Africa. She wanted to go on missions because she felt education was so important to her. She thought the way to move up in the world and in society was to be educated. And she knew that out in Africa, it was, there were so many poor people, she wanted to try to solve that problem. Except for, nobody was interested to fund that. So instead, she decided, I'm going to move further south and teach. And fortunately for us, we are benefited from that aspect. So what she did is she was an educator for nearly a decade. During that time, she met Albert McLeod Bethune. One of the interesting notes here is that their marriage ended in 1907. When we say ended, they really didn't get divorced. He moved back home because he could not find a job. What was most interesting was even in 1910, she put down that she was still married, even though they weren't together. It was more quietly that she just kind of said that they weren't together from that aspect of things. She founded the Daytona Normal and Industrial Institute for Negro Girls in 1904. What happened here is that within two years, she had 250 girls enrolled into this school, and it just ballooned. What's better about, what's really unique about this is while she had grown this school, she had been able to meet Booker T. Washington, who was able to teach her about fundraising, and told her, in order to make your school survive, you have to have money. You're trying to teach all these poor. They don't have funds to support their school, so you have to have a way to learn how to do that. And so she actually learned how to fundraise, and fundraise really well. And from that aspect, her school was the girls' school, and then the Cookman Institute was a boys' school. And she arranged for these two schools to come together, and she created the college currently known as Bethune-Cookman College in 1942. And she started, I'm sorry, she stayed president of that school until she retired in 1942. She did a lot of other things during that time as well. Because of all of these educational experiences, what ended up happening was she was president of several colored women's organizations. She founded several others as well. And all of these experiences caught the eye of several presidents. It started off with President Coolidge, where she, he welcomed her to come to a conference on child welfare. Because remember, her idea was to educate. Educate kids all the way up through college. Because of that experience, President Hoover had asked her to not only go and be part of these conferences, but they asked her to be part of the Commission on the Home Building and Home Ownership. So it's not just education, but it's trying to understand the finances to help people be homeowners. Try to help them understand finances, be able to buy a home and not just be enslaved and be in debt, okay? The biggest difference, and we're gonna talk about this on the next slide, is whenever she ran into President Roosevelt. She actually was really good friends with the First Lady. And because of her connection with the First Lady, she was actually able to do a lot more under Roosevelt's uh, 
tenure. President Truman later on asked her to be on the Committee for National Defense and official delegate to Liberia, where she went and attended a funeral on the behalf of the United States. So, what did she do for FDR? She was an special advisor. Now, she was one of 20 colored individuals that are part of this black cabinet. If you look at this picture, she's right in the center, and what's more important is she is the only female. That is part of this cabinet. Okay? What ended up happening is she also became what FDR did. She, he appointed her the director of the Division of Negro Affairs for African American women. And her role here was to help young people find jobs, try to educate them to be able to better themselves. One of the things that I found as resources online is when she was given this position, she was still president of Bethune-Cookman Co uh, Bethune College, but she was given a salary of $5,000 a year. When I compared that to other salaries, it was less than all the congressmen, which was at 10000 It was more than doctors and physicians. When I said, you know, when I looked up what was the correlation of $5,000 then versus now, that's about $90,000 a year of a salary. So he was not low-cutting her from a salary perspective. That's how well she was respected based on what she was doing here. All right. So, Fanny. Here she was born in October 6, 1917 in Montgomery County, Mississippi. This was, she was also from a large family. The youngest of 20 of sharecroppers. Now, one of the things to note about sharecroppers, if you don't know and understand, is that in the South, there were laws that keep black poor and broke and kept them from trying to move up in society. And sharecropping was one of those ways. They were free, but they were so indebted to the landowner that all they could do was keep on working. They never got free or out of debt. She left school, so she did start school. She learned how to read and write, but she had to leave to help her family, and she started working at the age of 12. She married Perry Hammer at 19, in 1944, and they adopted two daughters. She couldn't have her own. You're going to learn why in a little bit here, why she couldn't have her own. She received the hysterectomy without her consent during the Mississippi appendectomy. So what these doctors did was any time that a black woman came in with health issues, they took their ability to have kids away from them without their consent, without their knowledge. And that was another way that they were suppressing the ability to try to move up. They couldn't have kids, so they couldn't have extra help to try to get out of debt or other things, be educated, whatever that might be. After this moment, when she learned about it, she said, we've got to make a difference. So what did she do? She and 17 others tried to register to vote. In the South, they created laws, literacy laws, to see whether or not you could vote. It was biased. You had to pass this test to be able to get to vote. 18 of them went 27 miles down the road. Only two were able to actually walk into the building. They had several tests along the way before that. Fanny was one. Both of them left the building without being able to register. They were able to have the intent to register, so they had to write down, I want to try to vote. Now, what did the South do? Those offices sent the names to the landowners. So the landowners 
Southerners knew who was trying to vote. When she came back, her landowner said, you're done. He threatened her. He tried to get her to withdraw her application, and she said no. So she had to leave. She was fired from that. And so her husband had to stay for a few more years before he decided to leave as well. When they tried to do this again, they went to a conference to learn how to help others, to educate them so they can pass these tests, right? They went to South Carolina to learn this. On the way back home, they decided to stop to get a piece of food, you know, get a little bit of food to eat. Instead, they got arrested. Here, she was beat, and she was given lifelong injuries for the rest of her life because she was beat badly where she couldn't walk and she lost her ability to lose part of, use part of her arm. Those experiences, because of that, what she did is she started making a group in Mississippi. And they wanted the Democratic Party to give them some spots so they can have a right to vote. So, President Johnson did not want her to talk. Tried to let her talk at all. They tried to make a deal with this group. With this group, they said, you know what? We will give you two votes. However, Fannie not, cannot be one of them. They said no, absolutely not. We reject it, so she spoke. So what ended up happening is, when she started speaking, about a minute into her talk, President Johnson said, I'm gonna have a press conference. He knew, primetime television, all the stations were gonna be on him. The funny part is, he had nothing to say. He just didn't want her to be on live TV. It backfired on him. All the news channels heard what she had to say, telling her story about how she got beat, about all these tests that they, they had to try to pass. And so the news channels played this for the next three or four days. So more people actually watched her testimony than not. And so it backfired on President Johnson. And so, during this time, they started the Mississippi Summer Project, where they asked some college kids from the North to come down and help educate blacks so they could pass these tests, so they could vote. So, that address and nationwide protests across the, the country then put President Johnson on the spot, where he put into Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. What this Voting Rights Act did was said, the South, you cannot put restrictions, you cannot make these hurdles to make it difficult to vote. So the municipalities, so the cities and the counties can't do this. The states could, but the local areas could not. After this Voting Rights Act was passed in Mississippi alone, the number of people that can vote went from 28,000 to 280,000. The number of black officials in positions nearly doubled. And what she also did was instituted some co-ops. She tried to run for office. She never won a position, unfortunately, for her. But she still advocated to move forward. All right, she helped introduce Head Start programs, which is still in existence today. All right. I think I skipped one on cahoots, but we'll have to come back. This one might be a freebie for you guys. LaDara Harris, childhood and education. She was born on February 15, 1931 in Temple, Oklahoma. She was actually raised by her maternal grandparents because her parents divorced. Her dad was Native American, her mom was white. So she learned English in school, but at home, the community
Manchi was her main influence. She married Fred R. Harris, which was a high school love of hers in 1945, 1949. They married right after graduating high school. And he was also poor. So what she had to do, she had to work to help put him through college and law school. After that, they moved to Washington, D.C. after he was elected to the Senate. And it was here that she learned, I have some influence. I can make a difference. When they were there, they were considered Freddie and the Indian by some people. They raised three kids in Washington, D.C. as well. What she learned is that she would go to these weekly gatherings of Senate wives. And what these Senate wives would do is they would roll up bandages for the war effort. And she said, um, I'm sorry, we can do more. They didn't want to do more, so she said, I can do more. And with her background, and with the uh, civil unrest that was going on, she said, I'm going to make a difference for the Native Americans. So she worked with Oklahomans for Indian Opportunity to try to improve economic conditions for Native Americans. Because of that work, she became nationally recognized with the organizations that she had worked with. And with that, LBJ had appointed her to lead the Women's Advisory Council of the War effort. Okay? Some of the other things that she had done is when she was appointed, LBJ also appointed her to the National Council for Indian Opportunity. This was his way of trying to say, you know what, let's try to do something. things. But this council didn't do very much, so she left. So instead, she decided to work at trying to get land back for Native Americans. This group, the Taos Pueblo group, was actually from New Mexico. But they knew of her reputation. So instead of seeing their representative, New Mexico representative, they went to see the Oklahoma representative. Because they thought that there could be a difference. And lo and behold, this was the first time the federal government returned land to a tribe. During this time, too, she also created a course called Indian 101, which helped educate non-Native people about the unique roles of the tribal government and how that can work within the governmental system. And when she left this national council, she created Americans for Indian Opportunity, where she works with her daughter on these efforts. Okay? All right. Last bit of news is that she was a vice presidential candidate nominee with Barry Commoner, I think in 1980, on the Citizens Party ticket, which becomes the Green Party. This becomes the Green Party after their failed attempt to move forward. All right, so let's go back to Kahoot. This one was a tough one. The first African woman, uh, African American woman was Carol Mosley Brown, and we'll talk about her shortly here. One more question for you. Where is that, Ian? <laughs> Where are you? All right. All right, you're doing well. <laughs> Who is the first woman to give birth while holding a congressional office? Is it Tammy Duckworth, Nikki Haley, Catherine Cortez Mosto, or is it Karen Bax? All right, let's see how you guys did. Much more even straight across the board. 
and we duck her. All right. So we'll check the results in just a little bit. Let's go back here. Let's talk about Patsy May. She was born in Hawaii on December 6, 1927. What happened here is her parents actually had to immigrate into Hawaii before Hawaii became a state. She earned a BA in zoology and chemistry from the University of Iowa in 1948. She actually wanted to become a doctor. All the med schools that she applied to said no. Instead, she decided to go to law school. For us, we're better off for it, especially for those of you that are women student athletes. You're gonna see why in a little bit here. She earned her JD from the University of Chicago Law School, where she met her husband, John Francis Mink. They moved back to Hawaii. And she was elected to the Hawaii's House of Representatives in 1956. She actually failed in her first attempt. When Hawaii became a state, she wanted to be, and she went for that spot. Except for she lost. Why? Because the delegate representative, before they became a state, wanted somebody else and advocated for him instead of her. When all the things got finalized, when Hawaii got a second representative seat, that's when she went out and that's when she won. Becoming, and then whenever that happened here, she becomes the first woman of color to the national legislature and either the House of Representatives or the Senate. She's also the first Asian American congresswoman. Here she fought for gender and racial equality. She fought for affordable child care and bilingual education. She is the main person responsible for Title IX legislation. She is one of the authors and co-sponsors. Now, Title IX, for those of you, the the, what they initially started with was it allowed women to have equal numbers of sports to men. And with some wording in there, that is where some of the other Title IX things have come along. That, of course, the Trump administration has, has taken away. Okay. After she was a congresswoman, she was the, appointed the Assistant Secretary of State, and then she returned to Congress in a special election for a few more terms until she died. She died of cancer. Carol Brown, Brown. she was born on August 16, 1947 in Chicago, Illinois. She earned a bachelor's in political science from the University of Illinois and a law degree from the University of Chicago Law School. Here, she married, married Michael Brown, a divorce leader, and her start into politics was when she was elected to the Illinois House of Representatives. Later on, she was elected to the U.S. Senate, being the first woman of color elected to the Senate. If you can see here, when she was elected, these were, these were all the women that were in the Senate at the time. Not very many. She's also only one of two African Americans to serve in the Senate in the 20th century. Yes, we are in the 21st century. That number has increased not very much. She was influ influential to get to rejecting the United Daughters of Confederacy Design Patent Renewal. Their patent had the Confederate flag on it. She had to try to convince the senators that it was not a good thing. They would stamp of approval. And she became a barrier, and they finally understood, and they rejected that role. After her role as a senator, she served as an ambassador to New Zealand and Samoa, and she became the second African-American woman to seek the presidential nomination. The first one was Shirley Chisholm. Okay, going back to Keisha's presentation. Let's talk about Tammy Duckworth. She was born in Hancock, Thailand. Her family 
had to come to Hawaii separately. Her parents did. She earned a bachelor's in political science from the University of Hawaii. And then she got a master's in international affairs from George Washington University. While she was there, she entered the ROTC to become an officer. We'll talk about that on the next slide. She also started a PhD program at the University of Northern Illinois, had to stop that to serve in Iraq. So her PhD is actually from Capella University in Human Services. She married a fellow um, preservist, Brian Bowlesby. Okay? She has held leadership positions in both the Illinois and the US VA before she decided to go into politics. Her military service, the reason why I want to go into this versus some of the others is that I think this is unique aspect for her, for, for the person I'm talking about here. She joined as a grad student versus an undergrad in 1990. So when she became a commissioned officer in the US Army Reserve in 1992, she chose to fly helicopters because that was the only thing that she could fly. That was the only thing that they would let females fly. They would not let them fly jets or planes or anything else, only helicopters. For those of you that don't know, helicopters are dangerous because you can't eject yourself to safety, like you can jets. When she was flying combat operations in Iraq, her helicopter was struck by a grenade right under her legs. She immediately lost her legs then. When they crash landed, her co-pilot had to actually crash land because she lost consciousness. She tried about halfway through, then she lost consciousness. Fortunately, there was another helicopter that came. They pulled everybody out. She was the last one because they thought she was dead. But fortunately, they did pull her out. They got her to the medical hospital quickly, where they did enough work where she was able to go to the, uh, the um, I can't remember which hospital it was, the one that Trump went to, forgive me. Walter Reed? Walter Reed. She went to Walter Reed's hospital. Three days afterwards, they were able to save her arm, the use of her arm. She almost lost the use of her right arm there, too. So, after that, she became an activist for advocating for medical, uh, vet, medical care for wounded veterans and their families and she retired as a lieutenant colonel in 2014. So notice, she got struck in 2004, she stayed in the military 10 more years. And she actually got promoted twice during that time. She served the House of Representatives for four years before serving as a senator, and she became the first disabled congresswoman to ever be elected. She's also the first senator to give birth while holding office. And one of the things that ha happened here while she was pregnant is that the Senate rules did not allow children on the floor. During this time, though, it was very important that she was there because President Trump was trying to get certain people passed through, through their appointments, so there were a lot of votes. And she felt that she needed to be there to cast her vote. And so, her colleagues helped her pass some of the laws, and so she was able to actually bring her child, take a vote, go off to a room, versus having to breastfeed out in public. So there were some changes here, okay? All right, let's go back. There's your shift. Yeah, they're creeping up on you. You better get, start getting more right. Okay, which of the following women has held multiple cabinet positions but never elected to public office? Was it Susanna Martinez, Triangle? Was it Elaine Chow, Diamond? Madeline Albright, Circle? Or Condoleezza Rice, Square?
It was Elaine Chow. Uh oh. Kayla, Ali, and Jared. Jared's making the move. I'm not sure if I've seen them in the top five yet. Who was the first Latina American female governor in the U.S.? Was it Loretta Sanchez, Triangle? Is it Stephanie Gonzalez, Diamond? Michelle Chrisom, Circle? Or Susanna Martinez, Square? Haley. Some of you have not been watching politics. <laughs> All right. Ali, you're, you got a stronghold there. Oh, let's do this one. We'll come back. Whoops. All right. Who is the first Native American to be a federal judge? Is it Diane Joyce, Humitua, Denise Juno, LaDonna Harris, or Peggy Flanagan? Diane is triangle, Denise is diamond, LaDonna is circle, and the square is Peggy Flanagan. All right, that one is a tough one. Okay. Let's talk about Elaine Chow. She was born in Taipei, Taiwan, March 26, 1953. She is one of six kids. Her family actually also had to go to Hawaii in different segments, okay? Her dad actually wasn't able to come over until he actually got a visa to study and get his PhD. She earned a BA in economics from Mount Holyoke in 1975. Most of her education, even though they moved initially to Hawaii, they actually went to New York. And that's where they spent most of their time. She got an MBA from Harvard Business School in 1979, where she became vice president for syndication at the Bank of America. And if you don't know what syndications are, I didn't either, but it was mainly loans, okay? She then went to become an international banker at Citicorp, and then City Corps says, you know what, if you want to move up, you got to move across the country, you know, you have to move to a different country. She said no. She thought she had another opportunity, which she did, and she actually went to the White House, which I'll talk about in a little bit. During one of her stints, she was also president and CEO of the United Way of America. She became president and CEO after her predecessor had funneled money away from the organization into his own account. And so during this time when she was with the United Way, not only did she actually build the reputation, she made it more solid financially as well. She is also married to Mitch McConnell, in 19, uh, she married him in 1993. That was news to me when I looked this up because I was like, holy crap, I didn't realize this because we hear about Mitch McConnell all the time. Unfortunately for him, she is much better life than he is in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so in between the time that she was at City Corps and back to Bank of America, she actually did a one-year stint at the White House in a fellowship during the Reagan administration because she wanted to learn more about what she could do to make a difference with her knowledge. So she served with the Maritime Administration and the Commission. Those two are two different things. 
One kind of talks about schedules, the other one actually allows ports to open and close. Okay? Then she became Deputy Secretary of Transportation, where she learned quite a bit. Then President George WH H, uh, W. H. Bush had put her as the director of the Peace Corps. During the time that she was at the Peace Corps, as the director, she found five more sites for the Peace Corps to be able to go to and work. President George W. Bush then appointed her as the Secretary of Labor, which she passed with 96 votes to zero no's. President Trump, and she's actually also the only cabinet member in George W. Bush's cabinet that stayed on all eight years, okay? We can't say that about anybody for President Trump, who did appoint her as the Secretary of Transportation, which she still, I think, is one of the few cabinet members still in, okay? She is the first Asian American female in every single one of these positions. Just so you're aware, when I say that she's more popular than Mitch McConnell, even during the time of Trump, she got 96 votes again to become Secretary of Transportation, despite some Democratic concerns that she might privatize certain things. Let's talk about Susana Martinez. She was born on July 16, 1959 in El Paso. She earned a BA in criminal justice from the University of Texas, El Paso in 1981. She moved to Oklahoma, worked a little bit, then went to law school where she met her husband, Chuck Franco. After she worked, they moved back to New Mexico. She became the assistant district attorney and then the deputy district attorney. Then she had to go into the private world for a little bit because the person that hired her lost the election. So instead, she decided to run herself, and she was elected the, in, in the uh, New Mexico district attorney. And during the time that she was that district attorney, she helped pass Katie's Law, which enhanced DNA Collection Act, which is requires any potential felons have a DNA sample taken, just in case that comes up later on. She was elected governor of New Mexico, where she was New Mexico's first female governor, as well as the first Hispanic or Latina female governor in the U.S. Nikki Haley was born on January 20, uh, 20th, 1972, in South Carolina. She was raised Sikh. Her parents were Indian. She converted to Christianity when she was in her 20s. That was while she was at Clemson, and she also met her future husband at the time. She earned her bachelor's in accounting in 1994, where afterwards she actually went back to the family business. Where after, when she worked for FCA, uh, she worked in the corporate world for a little bit, then became part of her family business, the Exotica International. That was her mom's business. Her dad was a professor at one of the private schools there. She was initially elected to the South Carolina House of Representatives in 2004. When she decided to run for governor, she was running in last place before the primaries. She got some really key endorsements from individuals like Mitt Romney and others at the time that boosted her, where she was elected governor of South Carolina in 2010, where she became South Carolina's first female governor. She's also the first Indian American female governor in the US. She would have been the first Indian American governor if it wasn't for Bobby Jindal in Louisiana. She left this position to become an ambassador for the U.S. As governor, one of the things that she did I thought was interesting was she signed a bill removing the Confederate flag from the state grounds. Early on in her governorship, she would not say anything. 
until there was a shooting in Charlottesville. That changed her mind. And then she helped push that forward and push that through. And as I said, President Trump appointed her the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. And then we've got one more segment. I've got two more questions for you on Cahoots. A couple more people to present on. And then we will see who wins. All right. Ali, they're coming up. Two more questions. Who is the third female ever appointed to the Supreme Court? Is it Sandra Day O'Connor? Is it Sonia Sotomayor? Is it Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Or is it Elena Kagan? There have only been four that have been appointed, and the other is four, so you have a 25% chance to get it right. <laughs> All right. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is actually the second one. She was appointed to this position by George H.W. Bush. 
which was a Republican, becoming the first Latina to serve as a federal judge. Then she got promoted to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and later was nominated to become a Supreme Court Justice in 2009, becoming the first Latina Supreme Court Justice. I'm going to give you some numbers before I let you go and let you know who the results of who won here. As of 2020, 48 out of 127 women in Congress. Now, 127 women only in Congress of all the numbers. Not very many. But that is still more than what we had before. Four are in the U.S. Senate. The majority of them are in the House. In italics, this is the total in U.S. history. Only five women of color have served in the Senate. And only 75 women of color have served in the U.S. House of Representatives at all. 16 of 90 women as of 2020 served their statewide executive offices are of color. And 550 out of 2,000 women are, are women state legislatures. One of the interesting facts that I wanted to throw out there is the majority of these women are Democrats, which I thought was interesting, at the same time probably not surprising. So, with that, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And before I reveal the results, do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Well, so it was very interesting hearing you talk about that. Very interesting talk. Thank you for doing that. But I'm curious uh, how uh, how you, as a chemistry professor, ended up deciding uh, these women to talk about and how you ended up being part of the series. Great, great question. So, how I became part of the series was really instigated on trying to find some women that my daughters can learn about as they grow up and get older. Um, how I chose some of these women actually was a Time Magazine article that talked about 50 influential women in politics. And so I started there. And I selected all of them of color, kind of separated. And I looked at what they did, and that's how I narrowed down. Because I knew I only had an hour, which I'm right at, at that moment. And so I knew I couldn't talk about all of them. And so I just kind of chose some different ones once I decided which format I went with, which I went with the different branches of government, which I thought was uh, an interesting approach. Thank you for the question. Uh, I didn't like it to mention, but anyone uh, on YouTube who's live streaming can put uh, their questions in the comments, and then we will read them here in the three-dimensional room. Yes, answer, so. absolutely. OK, any other questions? I know you are all, you're only staying right now because you need to see the results. If you are on the top five, you get a prize. Let's see. In third place, we have Jared. In second place, we have Ali. And in first place, we have Eden. And also on the podium, we have Old Hair Joe and Morgan. All right. So with that, thank you very much for your presentation. If you have any other questions, please let me know. Ian, you're first. You come up here, grab what you want. Followed by Allie. No questions, Ian. <laughs>